Ee, öncelikle kısaca kendimizi tanıtalım. Yani tanınayanlar vardır ama e, ben Okan Urun ve Melis Tezkan 2006'dan beri oluşturduğumuz Biriken adlı sanat topluluğumuzla tiyatro başta olmak üzere performans ve video alanında çalışmalar yapıyoruz. E, tam da bu nedenle geçtiğimiz e, Mayıs ayında performans sanatı üzerine bir konuşma serisi yapma fikri doğdu. Biz de bu fikrimizi e, Pera Müzesi'nden e, Fatma Çolakoğlu ve Ulya Soley'e açtık. Onlar da sağ olsunlar bunu mümkün kıldılar ve bugün e, bu bir aşk şarkısı değil video sanatı ve pop müzik ilişkisi yukarıdaki sergi hala devam etmekte. E, sergisine paralel düzenlenen müzik bedende etkinlik serisi kapsamında bu konuşmaları gerçekleştiriyoruz. E, nedir bu konuşmalar? Bu konuşma serisini programlamak isterken programlarken istediğimiz epey zamandır bağımsızlığını ilan etmiş performans sanatını diğer sanat disiplinleriyle ilişkileri ve işbirlikleri çerçevesinde değerlendirmekti. Dolayısıyla biz performans sanatının sahne sanatlarının ve görsel sanatların kendi içlerindeki sınırları ve de e, bu sanatların diğer alanlarla olan ilişkilerini muğlaklaştırdığını, e, sorguladığını düşünüyoruz. E, bunu yaparken performans sanatının kendisi de dönüşüyor tabii ki. İşte bu konuşma serisi bu muğlaklaşma ve dönüşme üzerine e, bahsederken bir yandan tiyatrallik, feminizm, politika, kriz e, gibi kavramlar üzerinden e, ele alıyor e, performans sanatını. E, 19 Aralık'ta William Easton'ın kriz sonrası performans ve unutmanın önemi başlıklı konuşması ile e, başladığımız seri. E, bugün e, Caden Manson'ın aracı olan bedenler Big Art Group'un tarihi konuşması ile devam ediyor e, edecek ve 27 Ocak'ta yani Çarşamba günü de 18.30'da e, ismini görsel sanatlardan bildiğimiz e, Cana'nın bir mücadele aracı olarak sanatçının bedeni konuşması ile son bulacak. Hepinize katıldığınız için teşekkür ediyoruz. Şimdi sözü Melis'e veriyorum küçük biyografik bilgi için. Merhaba hoş geldiniz yeniden. Ben Kedin Mensin hakkında küçük bir biyografik bilgi vereceğim. Kedin Mensin Bigart grubun eş kurucusu. Contemporary Performance e, adlı sitenin editörü, New York'ta gerçekleşen Special Effects Festivali'nin küratörü, performans ve video sanatçısı, aynı zamanda da profesör. Cem Nelson ile birlikte gerçekleştirdikleri 18 Big Art Group prodüksiyonu 30 farklı ülkede gösterildi. Manson'ın video yerleştirmeleri Avusturya, Almanya, New York, Portland'da gösterildi. Painkiller başlıklı performansı Berlin, Singapur ve Vietnam'da gerçekleştirildi. Berlin, Roma, Paris, Montreal, New York ve Bern'de dersler verdi. Aynı zamanda Big Art grubun işleri, şimdi artık saymıyorum, dünyanın en önemli çağdaş tiyatro festivallerinde de gösterildi. Yeniden geldiği için teşekkürler, iyi seyirler ve dinlemeler. Hi. Um... Uh, my name is Caden Manson. I'm the director and co-founder, along with Jim and Nelson, of the company Big Art Group. I want to thank uh, Para Museum and Birken for inviting me. I'm very happy to be here today to talk about our company and present a little bit of our history. Um, we founded the company in 1999. We conceived uh, it as an ensemble and as <coughs> a flexible structure with many entrances and exits so that collaborators could come and go as they needed. From the beginning, we wanted to rethink the idea of the ensemble, both to adapt to the particular pressures of creating in a place like New York, but also as a structure that would reflect our artistic practice. Um, we founded the company with the mission of creating a contemporary language for the stage. Uh, it's a broad goal, but flexible enough, we hope, to encompass experimentalism and, and our understanding of how performance strategies and structures had shifted and would continue to shift. We're not interested in necessarily the new, but the now. We wanted to ask ourselves with uh, thinking critically, we wanted to task ourselves with thinking critically about uh, what we could say um, of our contemporary experience. Uh, how would our, practice, our praxis, our way of working, reflect the issues we wanted to discuss? Unlike uh, traditional performance, big art groups extended mediated performances repositioned viewers into active editors, challenging audience members to problem solve complex issues of race, sexuality, narrative, and truth as a theatrical mirror to the process of navigating, uh, navigation through contemporary society. Um, when I'm staging a work, I want to short circuit the audience's way of seeing and ask them to look at the complex structure of image and meaning manufacture. 
Our early work began with investigations into the intersection of performance and media languages. The eye of the camera and the eye of the viewer, or where memory crosses paths with scripted text, where sonic information contradicted spoken language. Um, we quickly became interested in the fissures and gaps in presentation and perception. Um, these are, that's, this is an image of Clerk of Catastrophe. And then uh, we also made a piece uh, called The Balladeer. Uh, in 2001, uh, Shelf Life was the first in the real-time film trilogy. It's about how the act of looking is an act of consuming. As a society, we're, we are voracious image eaters. We can't get enough uh, visual stimuli. At the, time, at the same time, we are told that images are worthless, that they're garbage, and uh, don't pay attention. We look, we see, we discard, and we forget. But do we think about where they come from, who is making them, who decides the frame, and what lays, lies just beyond the frame? Real-time film is a hybrid of film and theater in which actors recombine formal ideas of performance through the use of simultaneous acting on stage and for live video, using complex choreography, digital puppetry, and cinematic framing. Uh, this is a video of uh, a scene from Shelf Life. I'm just going to play this, and then I'm going to play the sister piece, and then I'll explain the, the construction and the structure. Shopping! <laughs> Did you know that some stores say they have the best everything, but they don't? Frankie, there was this guy. Should I put that in your room for you? Oh, okay. <laughs> thinking about the idea of cutting, how media editing is violent. Uh, the piece is about how the act of looking is an act of violence. 
Uh, in Flickr, two movies are cut into each other. One is called fiction and the other is called nonfiction. Fiction uses the tropes of horror movies and nonfiction is more about psychotorture and emotional violence. Also, thematically, thematically, we were beginning to work with the idea of circularity or um, of self-spectacularity, -spec <laughs> um, looking at yourself being examined. Uh, I, let's see, this may play. No, okay, good. So uh, this is the same setup as Shelf Life. Um, since it's a sister piece, the only thing that changes is the background's been turned upside down. Um, and this is, um, all of our work in the beginning was made with um, consumer grade technology. So it was anything you could go to the store and buy. Um, it wasn't professional. We also, uh, w everyone always called this kind of high tech, but we didn't ever think of it as high tech. It's actually very low tech. And, um, and, the, and the main technology for us is the actor. Um, the cameras in, and the media were really just turned on and focused in the beginning and then the show happens and the actors sort of perform the edits and perform the camera moves to sort of uh, point at the construction of images and the, and the structure, how we structure meaning. And, um, and then, anyway, so uh, I'm just going to point with the pointer what's what the stage is. So you have three cameras right here, right here, and right here. And these cameras just go directly to projectors that then project here. And then we've sort of manually lined these up um, here. So you can see kind of the edges. And for us in Big Art Group, we were really most interested in these edges, these fissures. These spaces where the, the image that you were looking at as an audience was beginning to sort of break and fall apart and lie to you. And, um, and we did a lot of things to sort of have you do, have you sort of buy into that suspension of disbelief that everyone does in theater. And then we would make things happen inside the film and sort of behind the film that would pull you out and sort of point at, point at the moment that you were sort of lying to yourself by buying into the image. Um, we talk about our characters as being cyborgs. They only really exist through the use of the technology. Um, they are these queer, sort of monstrous entities because <clears throat> they're boundaryless. We think monsters as, our definition of monsters is um, things without boundary and things that you can't define. So these characters sort of fluctuate and um, flip or flicker between sort of genders and race and sexuality. S um, and the structure of the way that we do it, the scenography and the media, the media we're using, make it so that um, when a character on the film is sort of crossing across the film, it takes three actors to sort of play that. So then we can play with the genders and the race and the sexuality of those, the biography of the actors playing this character. So the character will flip sort of between being a black man, a white man, a white gay man, an Asian woman, and the character is constantly flickering in that zone. Um, so I'm going to play this, and then uh, it's the opening of, of Flickr, which is kind of like a um, very simple credit sequence for two films. So it flips back and forth. Blue is the horror, which we call fiction, and this sort of greenish is um, the, the sort of psycho, the sort of psycho film, psycho um, horror um, of three roommates sort of torturing each other. Uh, and it's in the screen thing.
I just want to point uh, one more thing out before we move on. Uh, so we call this space here the, well here we'll do here, this space here the positive space. And it's the space uh, that the camera is catching and you can also see on stage. And then this we call the negative space, which is the, it's a, it's a space of construction. It's also an obscene space. It's not on screen, but it's on stage for you to view. Um, so, let's see. oh, this isn't going to. So this is the same scene, but it's top down. So you can see the, the choreography backstage of the actors. Um, I'm going to play it, and I'll just point at the negative and positive space so you can see. And I'll tell you like where it's looking as we go, because there's not a still of it. This is the positive space. We have our we have top space shot line. Uh, this is the negative space. These are the props. All the props. The other thing I would say about these pieces is, <clears throat> is that I've called them uh, failure machines. They're built, they're built to fail. Um, you can see the actors sort of struggle with all the cues and sort of aligning themselves. And that's part of the critique of the image that we're working with when we're making this work. So. Um, in 2004, we made the final installment of the trilogy of real-time film. Uh, this piece was called House of No More. Um, it's about how the construction of, of the image is an exercise in world building. Uh, there's this quote, this is uh, from Gemma, um, that sort of uh, led us in building this piece, which is a Philip K. Dick quote. And uh, it's pretty prescient. This was the mid-70s when he wrote it. Uh, there will come a time when it's uh, when it isn't they're spying on me through my phone anymore. Eventually, it'll be my phone is spying on me. Um, the main character. Okay, so um, we made this. This is 2004. So we're making it in 2003, 2004. 
Um, we began the work sort of between the two Gulf Wars um, after 9-11. Um, I think it's like the summer after 9-11. Yeah. Um, America was in this very sort of paranoid state, right? We're sort of suffering from this post-traumatic stress syndrome. Um, it was also around the time that uh, we had sort of the birth, in, in the States, the birth of the 24-hour news cycle, um, and this constant need for news and to sell the news. Um, and in August, before we started making it, um, August is this weird, uh, in the States, you, it's, if you know it's going on, in August there's the weirdest things on the news because um, there's always some sort of crisis because it's such a slow news cycle, nothing's really happening. Uh, and um, lately it's been uh, the Republicans make this budget crisis. There's like, oh no, we're out of money, and then it's this big political thing. Um, before that, um, in this, in 2003, it was um, little girls being kidnapped all over the country. It was a crisis. Um, there weren't any more little girls being kidnapped or less little girls being kidnapped. It's just the national media focused on it. And um, we began to think about, like, what does that mean as a metaphor for the America, like, after 9-11 to be, like, concerned about these innocent girls? And we were thinking, well, you know, it's because America sort of sees itself as this innocence, which is completely false because it's anything but innocent. Um, but it's a myth, right? Um, we haven't had any sort of wars, except for our civil war, um, on our land. And so 9-11 was this um, penetration, this rape, right, um, for us or what we thought. And so we were thinking about how would we make a piece about this. And um, oh, the other thing that's, that's happening is at, in this 24-hour news cycle, you have like talking, talking, talking about these girls. And you know, oh no, what are we going to do? We have to enact legislation. And then you have these like really hypersexual ads for things. And so you have this sort of flickering on TV of we're innocent, we're innocent, and then this sort of hypersexual selling of product. And we wanted to make a piece that sort of reflected that, um, those two opposites. And also, um, we were looking at um, Douglas Sirk, who was a filmmaker, and he made sort of American melodrama in the 50s, I think. Uh, so we wanted to make this kind of melodrama. And so what this piece is, is uh, we have this main character, Julia, and she's searching for her disappeared daughter. And in each of the acts, she sort of um, she goes to a new place because she thinks the daughter is there, and she sort of splits. So um, Julia won in Act 1. When she goes into, you see her in the second act, she goes into the second act, and she does her scene, and then all of a sudden, Julia 2 shows up. And it's the same character, but they're, they begin to multiply, and it becomes a sort of existential chase sequence. So by the time you have three Julias in the third act, are all sort of chasing each other and chasing this daughter that doesn't exist. Um, I'm going to show you the first act. Um, we built the whole thing on a green screen. We were, it was a commission from France, and in France uh, it's really bad luck to have green on stage. So we built the entire set in green. And then, um, and it was also sort of part of the idea that um, the, they're constructing this world through images. That's the set. I'll just point things out. Um, so you have four cameras here, here, here, and here. You have monitors for the actors here and here. And I think you have them there. I can't see them, but I think there's one there. And there's three on the in here and here. Um, then we have these rolling screens. There's actually three of them, but we do two for the first act, three for the third act, and then we sort of rip everything down and do it in a, a Luma key black space with a scrim in front. And then we had uh, three operators who are manually operating three um, computers, three mixers, and then this sort of patched together um, garage made uh, video wall so that they can all copy each other and sort of project those things onto the screens here. She wanted to. She's not that strong. She had to do it. You need to push me away. Do you really think that's possible? She couldn't have done it. No. She was taken from me by force. It's the only explanation that makes sense. What could she be running from? What is she running to? Someone? Do you think that's it? What are you? 
I need documentation of everything. You understand for your side of the story. I do look nice on <laughs> bed like that. I feel like shit. When are you going to do the next piece about me, Gary? I don't know. Because I looked in all the papers and there wasn't anything about us. About Kate, or me, or anything. I'm afraid everyone will forget. I don't know. <coughs> because people's memories don't last long. I can ask my editor. It's all a matter of timing. Can you tilt your face towards the light a little bit more? I feel upset. Do I look upset? I wish there was something I could do for you. Um, for the most part, we make our work uh, originally in New York and then perform in NYC, uh, maybe once a year or every other year. Um, our work has been shown worldwide. Um, this is a list of the venues we've been to or a selection of them. Um, the mode of production has expanded a little as the company has matured, uh, as we're always sort of tinkering with the process. Each production has its own method. Um, we approach every project differently. Um, we started to create work in other places, uh, expand beyond um, creating theatrical work. So we were doing all this touring, and um, we'd come to the end of uh, this trilogy of work with a certain kind of focus. And um, we sort of began to make other types of work. We sort of broke our research into three. Um, and the pieces are called Dead Set, The People, and Cinema Fury. And um, it's we're still doing group work, which is dead set, which is with the ensemble. And then we were doing sort of collaborations with musicians, which was Cinema Fury. And then we started to do participatory work, uh, community engaged work um, with the people, which is a project that we started in 2007 and has and still continues. Um, one of the reasons why I showed the slide before with all the places we've been to is because as a touring company, we were going to a different sort of city within a country or a different country every week and not really engaging with the community is sort of, you know, tap dancing and singing and then leaving. And um, uh, I'll get to, I'll get to, I'll, I'll finish that when we get to the next piece after Dead Set, when we start talking about the people, why, we, why I showed you that slide. Um, so Dead Set is a, was a new sort of format for us. Um, it was a serial project. It existed as a sequence of notes. Each part consists of an assemblage of modular concepts uh, that are arranged for the duration of the individual spectacle. Each dead set is a copy and alteration of the original one. Uh, there's no dead set one. There's dead set two and dead set three. These were organized, organized around the topic of the image of trauma. Um, at the time, I think we were doing the Iraq war and um, it felt so distant to us because, you know, it's a war happening somewhere else. It's happening with drones. Um, and, but every once in a while, we'd get these images, right, these images of real trauma of, of people suffering in Iraq. And um, as Americans, like, how do, you, how do you sort of come to terms with these images? You have no real relation to them. And they look so much like other things you see on TV, which are fake, you, like TV shows and movies. And we were wondering, like, how can we embody this trauma? How can we really try and look at these images and embody this trauma? Um, this piece actually was one of the first pieces we created out of, out of the country. We made it in Berlin uh, with a group of artists from France and Germany and then also our company. Um, it premiered at the Hebel am Ufer in Berlin and then went to Paris and a couple other places and then in the States. 
So I'm going to show you, I haven't looked at this in a long time, so I'm not quite sure what it is, but it's the opening of the piece. Um, the performers are in these kind of jumpsuits uh, and Abu Ghraib, it's like a mix between Abu Ghraib and Las Vegas, these sort of sparkly hoods. Um, and they're reenacting for the audience um, scenes from uh, war movies and then also scenes from horror movies, American horror movies. And then um, that's one sort of module. And then we'll move into the next module, which was, um, I think it goes into uh, this internet chat that uh, is between um, the uh, cannibal, do you know the cannibal story? It's from like the 90s, maybe, early or early 2000s in Berlin, where the guy um, who thought of himself as a cannibal sort of put out a call online looking for someone to kill and eat, actually eat, he didn't want to kill them. And uh, someone responded to him. Um, he lived outside of Berlin, and the guy, the other guy, lived inside Berlin. And the guy inside Berlin went out to his house, and they sort of discussed it. They had tea. They sat in the um, garden. They made a date. The guy went away. The guy came back. They tried to find a way um, for the person to be eat to die without the cannibal eating him, but he ended up having to without the cannibal killing him. And but they ended up having to um, uh, kill him. And then he ate him, and then he got caught. And then Berlin, and then Germany couldn't really um, couldn't really put him in jail because they didn't have a law against it, because it was consensual. So then they had to make a new law, and then he went to jail. Um, I I think of it as the sort of ultimate contemporary love story because it was two people who had this very um, intense desire and very specific desire that could only meet through technology. Um, they never would have met if there wasn't the internet. Okay, so we'll just watch this. It's a lot of screaming.
the fucking cold, man. And we just need a goddamn fucking this goddamn theater. We're in the middle of the freaking. I'm so scared. I'm Those were three modules. There's a module of the <coughs> horror films and the um, uh, war films, and then the emails from the um, cannibal, and then the smoke and the dancer who's actually he's enacting all the images of Abu Ghraib. He's just moving between them all. Um, so <coughs> in 2008, we made uh, this piece, SOS. Um, we were thinking about, oh, Bush was done. So Bush was out of office and we're thinking, oh, okay, so we have Obama. Um, you know, there's a desire in the country to start fresh, right, to have this clean slate. But the idea of a clean slate is really dangerous. Um, and so we were thinking of uh, the Rite of Spring and uh, not the music or the ballet, <clears throat> but the uh, story of a village that um, has to make a sacrifice in order to bring about the new. And uh, so we're thinking about sacrifice and like in America, like what would you sacrifice? How could you sacrifice? How could you sacrifice in a country that's so full of options? Um, and uh, we, in making this piece, we wanted to make a kind of celebration um, because in the, in the Rite of Spring, it's a, it's a village-wide sort of uh, pagan celebration. And so we built the piece and we made a club in, in, in Brooklyn. And we built the piece inside the club. So every Tuesday night, we would have this big party. And then we would perform things we had rehearsed throughout the week and test them out on the audience. We wouldn't say when we were performing, it would just happen. And uh, we built a lot of the work inside this um, party. Uh, in the piece, there's um, three stories. There's a story of a group of animals who are lost in a forest of technology and displaced from their natural environment. And in the end, they kind of become extinct. 
there are these two kind of profiles um, who are avatars who are um, trying to reboot the system because they have too much. And then there are these radical sort of revolutionaries who are um, actually trying to reboot the entire society or entire world. Um, there are these sort of trans or queer characters that decide that the only way they can do that is to um, make a television show where they do all the tropes of all the TV and in that have this feminist discussion of how to bring about the end of the world. Um, and in the end they decide to have a huge party and they all become um, hysterically pregnant and they give birth to this ghost baby that eats the world, which is all these balloons and stuff. Actually, that's the ghost baby. So uh, I'll show you just a little bit of this. Um, so there's eight screens all here. Uh, there's cameras here, here, here, here, here. We're actually using a large video system um, in order to construct all these images. Uh, a lot of times we're, I think you'll see two things in this. One of them is we're using LumaKey to sort of just place the, av the avatar profiles on this kaleidoscopic background of products. And then the revolu revolutionaries, we use an analog way of um, layering them on top of each other so where you can see the construction of this image over the, all the screens. The first, so the first part of this is the, um, is the profiles with Starbucks cups, I think. Okay, so I was talking earlier about the traveling around and um, wanting to do participatory projects inside of uh, sites we'd been to a lot. 
Um, so we were commissioned by Intiaccio Polverigi in Polverigi, Italy, which is in the Marche region near Ancona. Um, it was one of the hubs of us touring, um, and uh, we were teaching there during the summer, and they invited us to make a piece with them and with the town. The town is really interesting because they've had, it's 500 people, and they've had a um, avant-garde sort of performance festival there since 79. And so the, it's a strange town where everyone it understands avant-garde performance. And so it's a perfect sort of group to work with. Uh, so we wanted to make a sort of live uh, theater with large scale real-time film video, but with um, people who aren't uh, performers. Um, we were, again, thinking about all this talk that had been going on in the States about um, democracy, how we are bringing democracy, bringing democracy to Iraq or whoever we wanted to invade. And um, we were wondering, like, what the hell democracy means, right? And what does terrorism mean? And what is ideas of justice uh, in these places we'd been? Because I think in the States we have a pretty clear idea of what we think it is. But um, we wanted to do these pieces where we could travel around to different countries and ask uh, local audiences what what their definitions were. And also, um, these democracy, war, terrorism, and justice are these ideas that you can find in uh, the Oristaya. So we decided to do a, um, a performance that was inside of buildings in a square and then projected on the outside of the buildings um, as a sort of five channel live video um, true crime. So it's an interview with someone after a crime has happened. And um, the democracy, war, terrorism, and justice interviews that we've made, uh, we then put as the uh, choruses inside of the Oristaya and they project on the building. So the community is sort of watching themselves discuss these um, ideas which are um, can be difficult to discuss in public. And uh, it was kind of amazing what people were willing to say um, as giant talking heads on buildings to each other. Um, so I'll just show you. Oh, so, so we've done it in Polverigi, Italy. We did it in Theater de Valle in Halle, Germany. In Pulveri oh, This is an image of Polverigi. This is their town square, and we're doing it inside the mayor's, office, mayor's house. In uh, Germany, we did it in a Stasi, former Stasi headquarters, which was now the tax office. Uh, in Salzburg, we did it on the palace there, and then we've done it in um, uh, uh, San Francisco in the States, Portland, and then in New York. Um, and it's an ongoing project, and we've sort of collected all these interviews, and we, we're going to make a video piece out of just those interviews, because they're quite interesting the way people define these ideas. Um, This is the this is the building. This is the Stasi headquarters, um, in now tax office in Germany. And I'll play just a little bit of this because I feel like we're running out of time. This is uh, Holy G. <laughs> Vorrei riflettere con te su alcune cose. Io vado avanti a parlare. E sarebbe fantastico se tu mi rispondessi in modo onesto e sincero. Dimmi quello che pensi. Perché è questo che mi interessa. La prima cosa che ti viene in mente. Rispondimi in modo naturale. Anche se le tue risposte, risposte ti sembrano troppo personali. Non sono qui per fare una valutazione, non ancora. Dopo possiamo intervenire al montaggio. Ora apriti, mettiti al nudo, senza filtri, se vuoi. C'è qualcun altro in casa tua in questo momento? No. Sei da sola? Sì. Come fai ad esserne sicura? Per lo so, vivo qua. E sei sicura che non ci sia nessuno? Sì, sono sicura. Ti senti sola? Da abbastanza? <coughs> uh, so that's um, the interviewer asking this woman um, 
in the very beginning of the play, she's telling her how she should she should be honest when she's answering the questions. And then she begins to ask her questions about how many windows do you have in your house? How many doors do you have in your house? How far would you have to run down the street if you needed help to find someone you knew? So these already beginning these ideas of what is your community? Um, in 2012, we made this piece called Broke House, which was about the housing crisis and uh, economic breakdown in the states. Um, it is Three Sisters, and also this uh, movie called Grey Gardens. And it's a reflection back to the first piece we ever made called Click a Catastrophe, which was in that first uh, slide. Uh, in it, that's sort of the house. These artists are living in this house as a family. They're trying to survive. Um, they lose their house, and they sort of tear down the whole thing and wear it and leave the stage. Um, this, I'm going to skip this video because it's broken. <laughs> so um, I'll just talk a little bit about what we're doing besides uh, Big Art Group or through Big Art Group. We created four years ago this uh, online network called the Contemporary Performance Network. We, and now it's um, 7,000 people in 88 countries uh, who are performance makers. And one of the reasons, two things w why we were making it, one of them was that in, you know, in all these festivals we were going to, the best part about the festival is the festival tent where you meet audience and you meet other artists and you can sort of have this melting pot of ideas. And there wasn't really a space for that online. I mean, you have Facebook, but there's a lot of other noise on Facebook. So we made this dedicated space. Also in the States, um, they didn't quite understand what contemporary performance was. So you were either theater or you were performance art, but there is this space for a kind of performative um, discussion that we call uh, contemporary performance. Um, it's our idea is that it is, uh, it's a kind of performance that sort of moves fluidly between all the genres. Um, so we thought if we make this network, then we can just define by example all the people who are on it. Um, and then we had that for a couple of years and uh, we decided uh, there were so many people on it and there were so many people we'd never heard of uh, that we decided to make this book called The Contemporary Performance Almanac. This year is our third book and what we do is it's, um, it's open source, it's uh, group funded and for each artist that is in it we then print the book and send it to a, a presenter so that um, presenters can see this sort of work that's not in their uh, circuit. Because in Europe and in the States, um, if, if you go to one festival, then you go to a lot of festivals, and then you have this sort of tunnel vision of only a certain amount of artists are, that are touring. And uh, the presenters don't really have access to this other work unless they travel to that country. Um, and then out of that, we started doing a small festival in New York called um, a Special Effects Festival, which we do every January. This January was the third one. Um, it's during, uh, there's this weird thing in January where we have like six contemporary performance festivals. And there's a lot of presenters there who are buying work. So then what we thought we would do is, because we're always trying to disrupt things, <laughs> is that we would make this sort of artist-run festival with people that aren't being presented in the other festivals. Um, and then the other thing we do is we uh, publish sort of critical writing about our work. Uh, this is one of them, but you don't have to read it. Uh, this is contemporary performance. Uh, it's about 7,000 people on the network and then a reach of about 70,000 people through Facebook and uh, Twitter. Um, this is the Almanac from 2015. And uh, that's the end of my discussion.